18 page uh, <laughs> set of remarks. Uh, yeah. So no, I'm only kidding, right? Uh, just on bullets for me in case I want to refer to some of the issues um, I might want to talk about. But uh, thanks for having me, uh, Jim. I appreciate you reaching out. You did back in July, and we were in the middle of uh, the end of the session where I was sitting on two conference committees uh, on the major health care cost control reform bill uh, and uh, on a conference committee dealing with foreclosure as the chair of the Committee of Financial Services. So I was kind of tied up. I couldn't get here in July, so I really appreciate you ex extending me another opportunity. Uh, I, I want to just recognize Representative Michael Ice, who uh, came with me to uh, in the uh, village out of Block Party. Uh, it's a part of the district that we share together as well. And uh, it was nice of him to come with me. Uh, what, I, what I thought I would do uh, is just talk about uh, a number of issues that we dealt with in this last year and a half in this legislative session. Uh, a couple of issues that I think you can directly relate to in the North End. Um, uh, in some broader issues that I think are real important that, that really kind of reach into every neighborhood in the Commonwealth. Um, the, uh, the first issue, just because I, um, I was really closely uh, working on it as a chair of financial services, was a foreclosure prevention bill that I worked on with the Attorney General uh, that we hope will uh, really save people from losing their homes uh, through a loan modification process. Uh, it was uh, something that took a lot of work, but uh, there are upwards of uh, 100,000 uh, homeowners that are still out there in Massachusetts that fall into a category of what could be defined as a subprime loan. Uh, and the attorney generals across America had that settlement that you might be aware of, uh, where a lot of money is coming to Massachusetts, and the attorney general, uh, Martha Coakley, has set up what they call a home core program that's designed to serve as uh, you know, a, a conduit between homeowners uh, that have defaulted and are, and are struggling or, and are going to be foreclosed on, uh, to work with their lenders uh, if it makes financial sense to do so. Uh, if uh, the numbers uh, look like it makes more sense, the, the lenders are going to lose less money doing a loan modification, an interest rate reduction, extension of terms, a principal reduction, a number of different alternatives. Uh, it makes sense to keep people in their homes if they can. If, if it's just kind of going to band-aid a situation, uh, that's not what the law is aimed at, uh, at protecting. Uh, but foreclosure throughout uh, Massachusetts uh, hasn't been as severe as in other parts of the country, but, uh, but, it, but it has hurt some communities. Maybe not uh, the North End as much as it has the city of Revere, a community that I represent. Uh, Foreclosure has been a plague in a community like that. It has a really uh, aid to depress home values. Um, and so we think that this uh, foreclosure prevention bill uh, will definitely help people, uh, will save their homes. Uh, that's a real big piece. Uh, the, the cost control legislation, uh, of which I sat on the conference committee, uh, we estimate could save uh, anywhere from 15 to $20 billion to the healthcare system. Why is that important, right? So uh, we're, we're all focused on the premium cost, right? Because that's what we, uh, we worry about, it's what we pay, right? Uh, small businesses, individuals, families, uh, trying to get control of what the premiums are and how much they're increasing. If you, if you recall a few years ago, uh, small business insurance plans were increasing annually, in some instances, 25 to 30 percent. Uh, it was unsustainable. Uh, it hurts our economy. It doesn't allow for employers uh, to hire people. Uh, it's just bad all the way around. And so, uh, if you remember, the governor came in with his division of insurance and had the insurance commission freeze rates. Um, you know, that's not a sustainable approach to controlling the cost of health care, uh, but it was necessary at the time. And actually, since that time, uh, the, the rate of growth for insurance premiums, and particularly in the small business group market, uh, has been uh, a lot better. Um, but we need to do better. Uh, so the health care cost control bill uh, that we put together, we believe, will achieve that goal by containing the cost of the care at the hospitals. You know, I mean, that's the thing. we. We don't focus on as consumers. Uh, we think that 
you know, whatever my copay is, whatever my deductible is, is really all that matters. But the cost of the system, uh, you know, is something we don't focus on because when we have a loved one that's sick, it doesn't matter to us where, where they get their care, right? Uh, but trying to aid in the evolution of products uh, is real important. There are a lot of private payer uh, groups now have tiered networks, limited networks that are coming out. Uh, to get away from what they call fee-for-service and into more global payment, uh, bundle payment systems. Um, the approach we took, though, was, was, was less aggressive than some others might have wanted us to go in the direction of, uh, because of how big the health care industry is in Massachusetts. So we didn't want to kill the golden goose because the health care sector was the only sector in Massachusetts in our Great Recession that was hiring people. And they were growing jobs in that sector. Mass General employers employs more people in the city of Austin than any business. Um, and so the healthcare industry uh, is a huge part of our economy. Uh, and we were very cognizant of that as we were uh, drawing this up, uh, this legislation. Um, budget issues, uh, performance uh, measurement. I'm bouncing around, I apologize. If, if, um, if you have something that you think you want to ask, just shout out or raise your hand and if that's okay, Jim? That, although, no, 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 because he's off limits for questions. So hold on. I'll try to just touch on a few more issues, um, and, then, and then I'll do questions, because uh, I have a tendency to just go on a little too much. Right, so I apologize for that. Um, before I get to budget issues, uh, a couple of other bills that, that were real important. Um, prescription monitoring program uh, was one um, that I worked on pretty closely. It's um, the issue of addiction, uh, the issue of addiction in particular to prescription medications, opiates. Um, you know, it was really become an epidemic um, in, in all of our communities. You know, I talk about the issue of addiction to, and particularly to Percocets, to Oxycontins. It's an issue that no matter how much money you have, no matter where you live, no matter how much education you have or you don't have, you know, addiction is powerful and it touches everyone. I mean, there's not a person in this room that doesn't know of someone that has dealt with the issue of addiction, particularly in the last 10 years with prescription uh, medications. And so uh, we put together a bill a couple of years ago to create what we call prescription monitoring program uh, that was trying to get physicians to voluntarily participate uh, in keeping better track and having more accountability of how many prescriptions are out there. You know, we, we had an Oxycontin commission that looked at this, and you know, they found out that it was most common the first time an individual took one of these pills was either in their parents' medicine cabinets or in a friend's medicine cabinet because of such overprescription that's out there. Uh, and so we tried to create a prescription monitoring program to, to combat that a little bit more aggressively, and, Unfortunately, after a couple of years, there were only 3% of eligible physicians that were participating in it. Uh, and so my colleagues and I took another at that, and, and we tried to uh, advance this in a different way to require uh, physicians that are prescribing uh, a certain level of these powerful opiates uh, to make it mandatory for them to be a part of the prescription monitoring program. Uh, the governor signed the bill uh, just a few weeks ago, actually. Uh, we, we think that it is, it is really a, a good way uh, to combat this issue. Um, another way that we're trying to combat is through education. You know, I had an amendment in it that didn't make it in the final bill uh, that would have created uh, a pilot program uh, in communities that are at the top level of, of some of these uh, problems surrounding opiates in our schools. Uh, for a more aggressive education campaign at prevention. Uh, and unfortunately, that didn't make it into the final version of the bill. Uh, but, you know, Aaron and I learned a long time ago up there, it takes more than one at bat to get a hit, right, in baseball sometimes. And so we're going to, you know, take another shot at that in the next session uh, as we move ahead. Um, a couple of other uh, issues that uh, I think are real important. We passed uh, another uh, bill aimed at uh, veterans benefits uh, called the Valor Act. Uh, that uh, puts Massachusetts again at the top of the list uh, for benefits for our veterans that are returning home from overseas, uh, as, as should be the case. Um, we passed, uh, our, 
you know, I guess I'll kind of segue into some budget issues. Um, you know, the last few years have been real tough uh, financially uh, for people, um, and it's been it's been tough for the state. We've had to cut um, a number of different areas uh, in the state budget, um, but we've also had to focus in on trying to make state government uh, leaner and more efficient. Uh, we've had a number of different reforms of state governments, uh, whether they were pension reforms, transportation <coughs> reforms, that that will squeeze out uh, inefficiencies uh, and will make government leaner. Uh, and we also uh, took another step uh, to, to require uh, audits of, of vendor contracts, audits of the Medicaid program in the fiscal 2012 budget. Uh, and the, the program that we uh, implemented for uh, for these uh, what we call program integrity standards uh, has led to a savings in fiscal year 2012 uh, for $2 for every dollar invested uh, by the Commonwealth. Uh, we uh, advanced that a step further by passing uh, a state administration and finance reform bill uh, that uh, we believe will uh, advance this even further uh, requiring for performance measurement standards a lot of practices that are used today in the private sector, uh, we're going to ask state government uh, to move in that direction as well, uh, because we need to. Uh, if you don't, I'm just going to grab a swig of water. That's okay. okay. Doing all right? Fine. Right. <laughs> I'm going to use my touch sheet now, if you don't mind. Oh, how can I talk? So, you know, that's that kind of big picture, big issue kind of hat that as your senator, as your representative Aaron and I work on. Uh, together, but there are also you know local issues that we deal with in the legislature. Um, the Greenway, uh, the reform of the Greenway itself, uh, which Aaron Michaelitz did such a remarkable job uh, in leading the charge on. Uh, I'm real happy to have him work have worked with him on that, uh, and we hope to create more uh, community involvement through the restructuring of the uh, of the of the board itself. Uh, with the elimination of leadership council and putting, I believe, someone from NURA as well and other community groups onto the Greenway Conservancy uh, to lead to hopefully some more transparency and some more uh, communication uh, with the neighborhood where the Greenway is, and we're real happy about that. Uh, we serve as advocates as well, um, and together we stood uh, to say to the Mass Department of Transportation that you, you can't bring uh, those trucks through our neighborhood. Uh, you know, in, in the hazmat trucks. Uh, you know, we went and participated in the hearing in, uh, at the transportation building. I think that was a great victory for the neighborhood. It wasn't kind of everything we wanted, uh, you know, but it was great to stand with Mayor Menino, Salamatina, and Aaron Michaelitz in, in, in the neighborhood and advocate. Uh, and that was a nice victory for, uh, for the community as well. Uh, and of course, the Elliott School, the wonderful job that uh, the mayor has done and that the community did. Uh, you know, the advocacy was so strong on that from, uh, from families and from uh, people who live in the North End uh, to, to grow the Elliott School with such a popular school. I, I have a friend uh, uh, of mine and my wife's, uh, she went to high school with actually uh, in Notre Dame, Hingham. My, my wife's a South Shore gal uh, from, uh, from Plymouth originally. And uh, her friend just moved to the North End. Uh, and the reason why she moved, she's got two young kids. Uh, she's very involved. Uh, she works for the Peter Lynch Foundation. She's very involved with the uh, with the school issue here in Boston. Uh, she's so impressed with the Elliott School when she saw the expansion. She moved to the North End. She wants her kids to get in there. And I think that speaks volumes about the school and about what the community has done to help that school grow in the right direction. So playing a small role in the advocacy for that um, was a wonderful opportunity for Aaron and I, and, and we appreciate that. I'm going to jump around for one more second, if you don't mind, because I know I missed a couple things I probably wanted to touch on that were real important. Um, and government finance reform, human trafficking, no, I'll let someone ask that question. Uh, pension, pe you know, pension reform, again, pension reform was one, um, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, that we, we, we had to make some changes uh, to our pension system to make it more sustainable. Uh, so we enacted some major pension reforms, state employee pension reforms, 
that will save uh, upwards of five or six billion dollars uh, over a period of 20 years. And you know, the action that we took uh, was looked at, at in, in such a positive way by bond rating agencies that Massachusetts was given an upgrade in their bond rating status, which uh, a lot of states in the country were put on negative watch or downgraded in here in Massachusetts because of the actions that we've been taking to reform government, uh, to squeeze out anything that shouldn't have been done, um, and to reform a pension system such as this. We've been making the tough decisions that, uh, that need to be made. And I think you can see that, uh, you know, on the economic indicators that are stronger in Massachusetts than in most places. You know, our unemployment rate is uh, one of the lowest uh, at 6.1%, still not satisfied. We still need to make Massachusetts the most competitive state to do business. Um, but we can't turn, you know, our backs on what's important to us. Um, now I'm done on one issue uh, that, that I'll talk about, and then I'll do questions, okay? okay. What, I, what I mean by say that, you know, we, we ended the session doing a healthcare cost control bill, a real big bill, um, hopefully going to save a lot of money in the system. Um, but we also passed a bill adding a, a mandated benefit, and I said Jason Alulio will cringe down there because he works for the Mass Association of Health Plans. Um, but, you know, as a chair of financial services, we, we, uh, we heard from a number of families that they're children that are born with cleft lip or cleft palate, and that that was not a mandated benefit under Mass General Law. <coughs> And you say to yourself, well, Jesus, how could that be the case, right? We're the state that's got almost 99% of her residents with some kind of health care coverage. And after we did the analysis with the Division of Healthcare Finance Policy, we see it'll, it'll cost the private uh, payer insurance uh, customers, all of us, less than 25 cents a year to make that a mandated benefit. And if you could have seen the inconsistencies with the stories about families that reached out to their insurance companies and some of them said, we can cover this one. Others said, no, we can't, same procedure, we can't cover this one. These are children that grow up with a deformity that can be fixed. It can be fixed at a young age, but over a period of 20 years, 18, 20 different procedures. And, you know, I think the average person would think or would have thought that that was something that would be covered under the insurance, right? So uh, as a chair of Committee of Financial Services, my colleagues got together and we said, you know what, this, this is something we have to do. Uh, we passed that at the end of the session, the governor signed into law. I mean, we're looking to contain costs. I think we're doing a wonderful job with that in Massachusetts and we're gonna continue to do that. We're looking to reform government every way we can to make it more efficient, less costly for the taxpayer. But we've gotta take care of people. And then that, that's an issue uh, that we had to do uh, in order to take care of kids. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to address those, a whole bunch of issues. I wasn't kidding when I had 18 pages, but uh, this was a very productive session uh, for Representative Michaelitz and I and my colleagues. Uh, and uh, I thought I would just share a few issues with you uh, that I thought you might be interested in. Um, there's many more, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to give you a few minutes and I look forward to your, your questions.